uh, Hebrews chapter 12 uh, in our study. So if you'll open your Bible to that portion, we'll finish it off and move on. Every believer is a priest, and every believer priest has the privilege of personally and privately preparing himself for the study of the Word of God, using rebound if necessary, bringing every thought into captivity of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Once again, Father, we pause at the outset of our study to thank you for your matchless grace and all that it provides, to thank you for the provisions of that grace so that we could meet together this evening to study together the Word of the living God. May God the Holy Spirit take the Word and use it to help each of us to orient to your matchless grace, I ask in Jesus' name, amen. We're studying the doctrine of grace and grace means unearned unmerited favor it means that there is no way that anything that grace provides can be earned or deserved or worked for in any way Love is important. Unconditional love accepts you the way you are. But love doesn't necessarily give. Grace is forced to give. Mercy is God not doing what you deserve to receive? Grace is giving you what you don't deserve. Mercy is God not judging you. Grace is God giving you all the blessings that are related to His character. Grace is love set free. Grace is, is mercy the, the opposite of the other side of mercy in God abundantly pouring things on us. Now, grace is not understood. People sing about it, they talk about it, but they don't understand grace. A number of years ago, a pastor wrote a book entitled Grace is Not a Blue-Eyed Blonde. That was when Grace Kelly later to become the prince or the princess of Monaco or whatever, was very popular in the movies, a blue-eyed blonde. And he, pro he proceeded to seek to define what grace is all about. But grace is all that God is free to do for us because of the finished work of Christ and the cross of Calvary. And we move, according to Romans 5.20, from grace to grace. John chapter 1, verse, uh, beginning in verse 16 to 18, it says that uh, uh, we, we, uh, we receive from out of the fullness or the overflow of who and what Jesus Christ is, from His overflowing fullness, we receive grace in place of or heaped upon grace. Grace to grace to grace to grace. And this is how it works, and this is what we're studying. We began with common grace. Common grace means that God the Holy Spirit makes the, the gospel clear to the human race. There is nobody who in his spiritually dead, spiritually brain-dead condition, totally depraved condition, could ever understand the gospel apart from God doing something. Unless God's Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, 
made the gospel clear under common grace, nobody could understand the gospel. So the first work he does is common grace, making the gospel clear. At the same time, he has inviting grace or calling grace in which he issues God the Father's invitation for that person to exercise his free will and volition and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Now it's up to the volition of the individual. Will he exercise his faith? If he makes a volitional decision to believe, he's still not saved because it takes another work of God's grace. It takes efficacious grace. Efficacious grace takes the volitional decision, the faith, and makes it effective for salvation. If God the Holy Spirit didn't take faith and make it effective for salvation, the person could have all the change of mind and believe all he wants, would never be saved. Efficacious grace is necessary. This is pre-salvation grace. Now this is at the point of salvation. Following this, there are blessings of grace in which God gives 40 things to every person at the point of salvation. And the person doesn't feel one of those things. These are 40 things that God bestows upon you and most believers, 99 and 44, 100% of the of believers go through all their lives and will die and go to heaven before they'll know even a dozen of those things. They'll never understand the 40 things. Now, for those who are watching by television who would be interested, they are listed for you in our book entitled Grace, God's Middle Name. This takes all the teaching on grace and puts it in one booklet form and makes it available to you on a grace basis. But it is also listed in another booklet that I have compiled entitled 40 Blessings from God's Grace. This lists the 40 things that God does for you at the point of salvation. These booklets are available to you without charge, free of charge. Nobody will call on you. We do not have a calling program. This is saving grace. Now we move to the area of living grace. And under living grace, there are three divisions. The first is called logistical grace. And this is something that almost nobody understands. Logistical grace is everything that God does for the believer, whether that believer is good or bad, whether he's in fellowship or out of fellowship, whether he is carnal or spiritual, whether he's in reversionism or whether he is growing, whether he is in soul fragmentation or in because uh, uh, in, uh, his life controlled by God the Holy Spirit, it doesn't make any difference. God does several things that are logistical grace. One, he keeps us alive and makes total provision for the life of the believer, uh, which includes food, clothing, uh, housing, uh, transportation, uh, income of some sort to keep you alive in the devil's world, plus a lot of blessing that he adds to your life. And he doesn't bless on the basis of whether you earn it or deserve it. That's what grace is. Remember, it's grace. It's grace, grace, grace. It's always grace. And there are people who never understand this. David didn't understand it. Uh, David wrote at one time, why do the wicked prosper? I'll tell you why the wicked prosper, because God's a God of grace. He doesn't withhold or give on the basis of whether you're, you earn it or deserve it. There are some people who think, well, look, gee, I go to church every time the thing is open, and uh, uh, I, I just lost my job, and here my godless neighbor next door, he just got a promotion. Why? Because God is a God of grace. Grace means that you don't earn it or deserve it. You earn or deserve nothing from God. Everything you have comes on the basis of His character, logistical grace. Everything that God can do to keep you alive and provide for you in the devil's world. Everything that God can do to bless you. In, uh, uh, with uh, uh, everyday blessings, fantastic blessings. We used to have a song, count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God hath done. Well, people uh, don't even have to begin to count their blessings. Uh, just the fact that you could get up in the morning uh, and your name isn't in the obituary column ought to be enough for you to say, well, I've got another day. You know, some people aren't alive till the uh, coffee... Uh, Garfield asked the question, is there life before coffee? And the answer is yes, but some people would never know that. Uh, uh, but the point is that God it just pours His grace on us. We're graced out day in and day out. And uh, um, 
uh, we have been looking uh, uh, at this whole subject, and it is in, in great detail uh, in the book because it is so little understood and so rarely known that we uh, have to had to to uh, put it in the form that believers would appreciate. Of course, you always have uh, those people who uh, look and they say, well, listen, uh, it's because of my strength. That's why I have uh, my job. That's why I, I have it, because of what I have up here. That, uh, uh, that's why I have money in the bank. That's why I have clothes on my back. It's because uh, uh, of my hard work. And uh, I always remind those people, and you're watching right now, and you think that, don't you? You're sitting there and you say, listen, the only reason I've got what I've got is because of my hard work. Let me remind you what God says. He talks to the people of Israel, and he says, look, when you've eaten and you're satisfied, praise the Lord for the good land he's given you. Be careful not to forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commands. Otherwise, when you have eaten and you're satisfied, when you build your fine houses and you settle down, when your herds and flocks grow large and your silver and gold increase and all you have is multiplied, you got a big bank account, you're healthy as a horse, you're, uh, you've got everything you want, you got that beautiful house you've been working for, you got that lovely landscape, you got that place in the country, you got a boat on the side, you're driving that big car that you wanted. Just change the idiom, that's all. Otherwise, when you have eaten and are satisfied, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord, your God. You may say to yourself, my power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But you better remember this. It is God, the Lord your God, who gives you the ability to produce wealth. Folks, what would it take to knock you off your pedestal? I, this week, two men who had been swimming with me, I've been swimming now for three years and uh, got to know some of them, two men came in that I hadn't seen in a while, both of them. Both of them were hale and hearty, had retired, and were just enjoying their retirement. Both were struck with cancer, like that. One brain cancer, he, he, he said, this isn't the crew cut. He said, this is because they're taking cancer tumors out of my head. He may, was made, making light of it, but they had taken the large tumors out and were now treating him with, with uh, 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 radiation to try to... Uh, leave they, the other man was a teacher at uh, your school. Uh, you, I've talked about him in the past. He retired last year, finally free. Cancer of the mouth. Talks funny now. Can't, can't, uh, can't drink without water or the drink running out on the side because it's all numb. It's, it's, uh, you know, what is it going to take to realize that if you have anything, it comes from God's grace? Never forget that. We are total products of the grace of God. That's important because they, if you don't understand this, you won't understand number six. See, number six then, the sixth grace, is correcting grace. The people come along and they say, yeah, well, that means we can sin and do whatever we want. No, 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 no. But understand this. God never gets mad at you. Remember a few years ago in uh, one of the TV programs they had, uh, one of the characters would say, God's going to get you for that. And they even came up with a song. God's going to get you for that. God's going to get you for that. But God's going to get you for that. Well, God isn't going to get you for that. God never going to get you for that. That's not God. God is a God of grace. And when He disciplines he always disciplines for the purpose of correction. The Greek word is looks like this. P-A-I-D-E-I-A. -E -I -I paideia. And it, means it refers to education in general. And, uh, but we've talked about the specific meanings of it as related to what uh, uh, Dr. Wiest has said. 
It's used of training and education of children, but even in adults. It speaks of that which cultivates the soul, correcting mistakes, curbing passions. It speaks of instruction which aims at increasing virtue. It doesn't have in the idea of punishment, but of corrective measures that will eliminate evil in the life and encourage the word. God never gets mad at you. God has never lost his temper and disciplined you and me in, in a fit of temper. Unlike parents who do that, our earthly parents, God is a loving Heavenly Father. He never disciplines in anger. He never disciplines because he's had it up to here with your bad life or your sins or whatever it is. God is in the process of gently teaching you. And sometimes it takes a little more than others and uh, you don't listen. The first stage is called warning discipline. And God gently warns you. The second stage is not the word paideia, but this word. M-A-S-T-I-X. Mastiques. Mastiques means to skin alive with a whip. You no doubt heard the story of the the uh, Amishman who was selling a mule. And he said, this mule does whatever you tell it to do. The guy bought it, took it home, and he couldn't get it to do anything. And he said, took it back to the Amishman. He said, well, you've lied to me. He said, oh, no, no. He said, I'll show you. So he took this big two by four out and went, and he whack! He hit that mule across the head, told it to do that, and it did it right away. He said, why did you have to hit it with that big two by four? He said, you have to get his attention first. Well, sometimes God has to do things for us to get our attention. You know. Get our attention. That reminds me of the story of the fellow who bought a mule from a religious minister. And uh, whenever he would say, uh, hallelujah, the mule would stop. He said, praise the Lord, the mule would go. He was riding on the mountains one day, and he's driving along, and he's coming close to the edge. <laughs> and he's yelling, whoa, 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 the mule would not, whoa, whoa, please, whoa. Oh, and if he's about to go over, he said, well, hallelujah, Lord. And the mule stopped. He said, well, praise the Lord. Well, anyway, uh, neither there nor here, just thrown in to see if you were awake. Correcting discipline on the part of God is defined for us in Hebrews chapter 12. God tells us in beginning in verse 4, do not make provision to sin. Give it a wide berth. Then in verse 5, he says, start, he gives us two wrong attitudes, three wrong attitudes. One, uh, don't forget doctrine. Don't forget the Word of God. That's the first one. The second one is... Uh, do not uh, 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 take lightly or think lightly of discipline. Don't take it lightly. Don't, don't shrug it off. The third is to don't be discouraged when you're disciplined. Because after all, God is, is always right. And I use the illustration of the fact that I could never be a salesman because I, I take the turndown as personal rejection. I never, the first time I ever, I guess it goes back a number of years, I found out tonight, Jerry, I'm one year older than you are, so you, you see, I have the patriarch here. <laughs> I, got, I got your birthday. Okay, but anyway, uh, uh, they advertised in one of the comic books, S kids, sell Cloverine brand salve. And I thought, boy, you could make a million dollars and get all these kind of things that they advertise. So I sent for this Cloverine brand salve. And this big box of stuff comes. It comes in little round tins, and I was going to go out and I was going to sell it, see? My mother and father discovered that I sent for it. They were not very happy with me. And especially when I first started to sell it, I tried to sell it, and the first two people turned me down. I never tried again. My parents bought the whole box. We had Cloverine band salve for everything for years and years and years. I wouldn't uh, doubt that if my mother's, when she died, still had a few bottles of uh, a Cloverine brand salve. I couldn't take this. Couldn't take Rejection. Because that's, I, I just am not meant to take rejection. However, I take it personally. When God rejects your plans, when God rejects 
your proposals. When God rejects the direction that you have decided in your decision that you're going to make, that's a different story because God is saying to you, look, I love you. That's what the next verse, next verse says. For whom the Lord loves, He disciplines, verse 6. That's the idea. He disciplines and He skins alive with a whip every son that he receives. And so when God does it, in love, he reaches down. Contrast that with, with uh, verse 8. If you are not disciplined by God, and everyone undergoes it, then you are an illeg illegitimate child. If God doesn't spank you when you go astray, if God doesn't correct you when you're wrong, if God doesn't lead you in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake, then you're not a true son. For what son is not disciplined by his father? And so it is that we, uh, uh, in love, God reaches down and rejects our plans and puts us on the, the, the correct way. And uh, so this is the kind of a, of, a, of a father he is. Unlike human fathers, he says in verse 9, Moreover, we have all had human fathers who have disciplined us, and we respected them for it. Not always, but some. Some parents don't know how to discipline. How much more should we submit to the Father of spirits and live? The point is, human fathers will make, uh, will discipline, and they'll make mistakes. There's never been a perfect father, just like there have been no perfect children. And the human father will make mistakes, and yet they end up receiving respect, even though they have made mistakes as a parent. But the Heavenly Father never makes a mistake as a parent. When He disciplines, it is always, always right. And He does it in three stages. First is the warning stage. This is the gentle calling. This is the, uh, the, the, the stage that says, wait a minute, you're heading in the wrong direction. Um, my mother used to call whenever she wanted me Billy so I'm, I'm sorry that's the only way I can tell you that's how it went could hear her a mile away when she wanted me to come home when she called me Billy I was all right when she called me William look out that was see that was the, the warning was over she was about ready. She was about ready. When I was at, at camp, I used to, as a camp director, I always had, I had a little a cliche that I used. Okay, and when I used it, they knew. When I said, you are kindling my wrath, they all knew that the, uh, the guillotine was about to fall on them and they had better shape up. But the warning stage is the first. The intensified stage is next. That means it gets real tough. Let me tell you, in the intensified stage really hurts. And the third stage, if you don't respond to them, then God takes you out of this life in the third stage, which is the sin unto death. See? God removes you. In fact, that's what it, it, what it talks about in 1 Corinthians 11.30 when he says, for this cause, that is, there were some believers who were taking the communion service uh, uh, lightly. They were, they were not judging the sin in their lives. He says, for this cause, many among you are weak, and some are sick, and some are asleep. They weren't sleeping. They were, he uses that term for Christians who are dead. They, were, they had committed the sin of death. God removed them from this life. Now, the purpose is given to us in chapter 12, verse 10. For our human parents... On the one hand, disciplined us for a short time according to what seemed best to them. The best that the parents could do is to discipline on the basis of what seems the best. And as I've said, all of us as parents have made mistakes. All of us, if we had to do it over, would probably make a number of changes in the way we have done it on the basis of what seems best. But, the verse goes on, God, on the other hand, always for our profit. 
for our gain, for our blessing. In order that we might receive a share of His divine integrity. The share of divine integrity is simply the blessing that He has for you that He wants to pour out on you in this life. He wants... God... Remember this, beloved. God made you. Since He made you, He knows what will make you happy. You think you know what will make you happy. You don't. You think so. Uh, there are many people who uh, think they know this is the, the route that I want to take. It is the, what will make me the happiest. Uh, some, uh, finding the right boyfriend for some uh, 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 hot pants girl. Uh, some, uh, uh, finding the right girlfriend for some guy uh, with his libido at a high uh, stage. Uh, finding uh, a million dollars, uh, having an easy uh, job or not having a job or whatever it may be. Fill it in. We all think this is what, if what makes us happy. God says, look, I made you. I know what will make you happy. And I have it here for you. I'm, I have something to make you happy. I have something that is called the life beyond dreams. I have it for you. I, have it, I can't give it to you till you have capacity. You have to have capacity. And that's what uh, is coming up in the next increment. But what is capacity? Well, uh, I, I used to have a, a humorous talk that I would give around the country uh, called the Pauli absorption method. And I would uh, start off talking like it was a scientific thing that my father had discovered many years ago. I have a, my, my briefcase with me. And really what it is is the Pauli absorption method of donut dunking. And uh, uh, then I would just point out that there are uh, real hazards to this because sometimes you have a cup like that, to pull out a Demitasse cup, you know, one of those little things. You couldn't get a donut in there to save your life, maybe the tip of it. And, and those are worthless, so you put that away. And then there are the kind of cups that you can't even get your finger in. They've got, uh, they, they're sort of shaped like this, you know, uh, and they sit in the saucer, and, they're, and they've got one of these things, and you can't even get your finger in the thing. Uh, and if you could, you'd just get a portion of your donut in there, see? Not big enough. And, uh, and so, and then I bring out my big mug that I... I had, you know, a great big place you could get. You could hold it like that, see, and uh, fill it with the golden elixir. Brought my old golden elixir always in a thermos, so I'd fill it up, you know, and, and have it all there. And then I would bring out the donuts. An ordinary donut is no problem, you know. Uh, and then I would show what it was like. Uh, and then, then my father faced the problem of uh, of the the glazed donut. Where, I mean, there's no place to absorb the liquid, and so he faced that. And after many years of of study and uh, careful mathematical equations, he discovered that if you break it in two, you have two areas of entrance so that the golden elixir can come in and you could boot both sides. And of course, the big thing it took him five years to find the answer for was the twist. I mean, after all, when you get one of those twists, how do you handle that? Uh, I mean, you, well, he found out, it took him five years, I said, but he untwisted it and then he, then he could dig it in. And, it, and then I would always you know, uh, make a big deal. It was fun. But the point that I'm making <laughs> with this whole business of, uh, what was I making? Oh, no. <laughs> Is that uh, uh, the different size cups have different capacities, see? And uh, God talks about uh, my, uh, the, the psalmist says, my cup runs over. You're building a cup in your soul. And you start out with a thimble. That's all you've got. I mean, that's all really... You got and a, a thimble. What is the capacity of a thimble? Very, very little. Very little. And then you get one of the demitasse cups, the little bigger things, you know. Uh, and then eventually, maybe you'll get uh, uh, the cup that's shaped like that. But eventually, you get the mug, you know. Uh, and uh, when you have the mug, the the greater your cup, the more it'll hold. The more that God can pour into your cup, and so you. You grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and you, comp you increase your capacity to receive. God cannot pour into a cup that doesn't have capacity. Let's talk about capacity from the, uh, the human realm. You have uh, the, the, the insurance companies. They say if you have a male uh, automobile insurance company, if you have a male in your home, under the age of 24, unmarried, he pays for his insurance through the nose. 
Girls, they, female, pay less. They say because the male at that age has less capacity, he has the capacity to go, not enough to stop. I think that's, you know, and I can see, I've seen that, you know. Capacity to go, but not capacity to stop. They have capacity to drive a car at age 12, age 13. But they say you don't get a license till you're 16, and then we want you to take driver's ed so that you really will be trained properly. I don't know if it does any good, but you'll be trained properly. And then you can drive, but still pay the premium. Hopefully by the time you're 25, you'll have the capacity to not only put your foot on the gas, but also on the brake. And so then they'll drop your insurance company, your insurance rate considerably if you'll do that. Whether they're right or wrong, I, I'm not saying. I'm saying that's an illustration of the if, if, automobile insurance company relationship for capacity. Capacity. And so it is with this. God wants you to build the cup in your soul so that he can pour into your cup. And so he says that he, God, for our profit, gain, or blessing, in order that we might receive blessing in time based on our capacity. And how do you build capacity? Bible doctrine in your soul is what builds capacity. The Word of God is what makes your capacity increase. And every day that you take in Bible doctrine, your capacity gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Do you ever have a balloon? Sometimes in our kids' club we play a, a game in which we, we give them a balloon and say the first one to blow up their balloon and break it is the winner. Well, now, even a little kid has got the ability to blow, but he can't blow up a balloon. They, they don't know how to blow up a balloon. They go, and it blows out of their mouth. Uh, and then they blow. Now, what we do then is we take it aside and we blow it up. And then we got to let the air out and we give it to them. Then they can blow it up. See, we have increased the capacity. As a balloon that's not been blown before, it has no capacity for air. You have to force it to have capacity. However, once you have blown up the balloon, you've increased the ability of that, that rubber to handle air, and the, even a kid can blow it up. It, the capacity increases. And so you increase the capacity of your soul by the more doctrine that you take in. And your capacity becomes bigger and bigger, so that David writing as in the 23rd Psalm, when he says, My cup runs over he is saying this that when god pours blessing into my into the cup of my soul it is it fills it up and it, and it overflows and then he says surely goodness and mercy shall follow me no 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 the verse the hebrew says surely grace and uh, blessing shall pursue me all the days of my life god is pursuing us waiting to pour out the blessing in our lives And so divine discipline is designed to, uh, to cause you to, to stop sinning in your life, to uh, recover from uh, your reversionism, to function inside God's divine dynosphere, uh, functioning under the power of the Holy Spirit, executing the plan of God for your life, uh, turning your back on the cosmic system, and to accelerate your spiritual growth so that you'll grow up spiritually. Now, once you have uh, recognized the discipline in your life, there is one response, and that is called rebound. Rebound is 1 John 1, 9, which says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now let me point out what this word here is. This is the Greek word, H-O-M-O-L-O-G-E-O, -O -O, translated confess. Now logeo means to speak. Homo means the same. Homogenized milk is all the same. It doesn't have the cream and the, and the uh, or milk is separated. Same, speak the same. The best word to translate it is to acknowledge. To acknowledge it, or to cite it, or to name it. You'll notice it doesn't mean to tell God you feel sorry for it. God's not asking you to feel sorry for anything. 
Or it's not asking you to, he's not asking you to promise him you'll never do it again. That's not the issue. The issue is if we confess our sins, if we acknowledge our sins, what? He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. But you see, you've got a lot of other things that are in your life, which are called unrighteousness, but your spiritual growth hasn't revealed them to you uh, as yet. And so when you confess the sins that you know, God forgives them, and he cleanses you from the other unrighteousness. As you grow in grace, there'll be more things that he will reveal to you that he doesn't want in your life. But just like a baby starts uh, uh, by crawling and then walking uh, and then maybe riding his uh, big wheel and then uh, he rides a tricycle, uh, uh, then he gets to ride a small two-wheeler and eventually he gets his 10-speed over here. Uh, when he's on his 10-speed, he doesn't even want to go uh, play with his big wheel anymore. And as soon as he gets in and drives that car, the 10-speed hangs there in the garage. I know, I've got one for sale. But uh, uh, why? These things pass away with growth. And that's how it works for the believer's life. As you grow up, there are things which pass out of your life simply from this source of spiritual growth. Then nobody has to come along and say, Oh, shame, shame, shame on you. You shouldn't be doing that. We leave that to God. We leave that to God. All right? And so uh, you confess your sin, God forgives you, and you're, you're, you're right back there. You're right back in fellowship. You are in fellowship. Now, you've lost some time. You've lost some time. But don't ever believe what some of these preachers will tell you, that the bird with the broken pinion never flies as high again. I've heard that. I've heard that poem given by many guys uh, from pulpits around the country saying that uh, the bird with the broken pinion never flies high again when a pinion is a wing. That the bird with the bro Let me tell you something. God specializes in new wings. And if you're forgiven, you're forgiven. And God doesn't hold it against you. God isn't sitting there saying, boy, I, I, he's going to do it again, and when he does, I'm going to whap him. No, no, God isn't waiting for that, not at all. Now, when you do this, there are three things that can happen. First of all, he can remove the discipline from you. Completely. All the suffering that, is, that he brought into your life to wake you up, called warning discipline or skinning you alive with a, a, a whip discipline, that is removed. Or the discipline can be diminished, but it is now continued for your blessing. He has a means of blessing you with that. Or it may continue at the same intensity but again, it is uh, because God wants to give you fantastic blessing from it. But once you have for confessed your sin, it's gone. He says that if you, uh, what does he do with our sin? He buries it in the depths of the sea. He removes it from us as far as the east is from the west. Aren't you glad he didn't say north to south? You can go north and you come to the North Pole. You can go south and you come to the South Pole, then you're going north. But he said, east from west, you go around the world a million times east, you'll never be going west. You go around the world a million times going west, you'll never be going east. Why? Because east and west never meet. That's why he says, I have removed your sins as far as the east is from the west. He says, I have placed them behind my back. He says, I will remember them against you no more. He says, I have blotted them out as a thick cloud. I mean, well, more, how much more graphic does he have to be to tell you that when you have confessed your sin... God forgets it. There used to be an old song that said, God remembers to forget. I love that. God remembers to forget. So you've sinned. Who hasn't? So you failed God. Who hasn't? So you've fallen flat on your face. Grace, correcting grace, doesn't hold it against you. Spurgeon used to say that if the best man who ever walked this earth had his sins written on his forehead, he'd wear his cap down to his eyes. Who is, uh, who is without sin? Nobody. Who therefore has a right to pick on anybody else? No one. And God says, if you confess your sin, it's forgiven. And if it's forgiven, it's forgotten. It's gone. And you, you, you have to trust God. You have to believe that. 
but not thinking that, you know, God is waiting up there to get you. That's not grace. Job 5, 17 and 18 says, Behold, happy is the man whom God disciplines. Therefore, do not despise the discipline of the Lord. He's called El Shaddai. El Shaddai in the Hebrew means the God of many breasts, which means that this, is a, this speaks of his, uh, his uh, uh, logistical grace. Uh, the, the God who is just always giving us grace blessing. So he says, do not despise the discipline of the Lord, for he wounds, but he also binds up. He wounds, but his hand also heals. And when he spanks us, it literally says, this hurts me more than it hurts you. He does, because he is touched with the feeling of our infirmities. What a wonderful Lord he is to discipline us. Now, I want to talk about installment discipline. Now, there are times, beloved, when you or I, as a believer will sin so badly that is we we will do something so drastic that if god were to punish us for that or would give us discipline it would be it would be so much that we could we would be despondent dis, full of despair we would give up and so god uses what is called installment discipline. Sometimes believers will move out of the divine dinosphere and they'll stay out for a long time before they actually come to their senses and use rebound and get back into fellowship. Now God has to impress on this believer the stupidity of of making that kind of a decision. God wants this believer to understand, look, I forgive this sin. That's, I'm not holding it against you, but I want you to understand that when you make a decision like this, you have made one stupid decision. And I want to keep you from making that decision again. And so... What has happened during this period of time, the warning discipline, the intense discipline, has accumulated so much that if God gives it to you during this time, you'd be a gone goose. So, he does it in installments. And here's the the example. It's found in 1 Samuel, or pardon me, 2 Samuel, in the story of David. When I mentioned it the other evening, I was going to teach it. <laughs> Diana had it. She knew exactly what I was talking about. I thought it was first from experience, but it wasn't. <laughs> Turned out to be she knew David. All right, the story of David and Bathsheba, folks. Now, David is out of fellowship. He's living in the cosmic or the world system in 2 Samuel chapter 11. And what does he do? Well, in the first place, he fails to be where he ought to be, and he puts himself in a position where he can observe the woman's bathing area. Verse 2, 11. One evening David got up from his bed and walked around the roof of the palace. He knew where he was going, by the way. From the roof he saw a woman. They had a communal bathing area. The men had one, the women had the other. David knew where, he to, where to go, where he could see the ladies bathing. And he didn't just go along and say, oh, what? I stumbled on it. No, he, he knew right where he was going. All right? From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful, and David sent, sent someone to find out about her. And the answer comes in. So the first thing he does is he commits adultery. He, has a, he fornicates with Bathsheba. Then, because of the fact that she now becomes pregnant, he works a plan in which his faithful servant 
uh, Uriah the Hittite, her husband, is murdered. He, 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 he works for the murder of Uriah the Hittite. Can you, uh, he actually sees to it that he is murdered. And then David pretends to be the big benevolent uh, uh, savior, and he's, I'll, I'll take this poor pregnant woman to be my wife and raise the child as my own. It was his own. Who do you think he's kidding? Well, the whole nation, but not God. You see. All right? He's in, now he's in reversionism, he's in soul fragmentation, and he's covered his sins, and yet he is miserable. I want you to see how miserable David is. He's out of fellowship. Turn to Psalm 38. Boy, I tell you. See, when you try to cover your sins, when you try to pretend they're not there, uh, here's a couple of years that David is going through this. See? Now, he begins Psalm 38, and he says this, O Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger or discipline me in your wrath. See, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't understand what we understand about the grace of God. David lived hundreds of years ago under the, the progressive revelation. He didn't have everything. But I want you to notice what's happening to him during this period of time while he's covering his sin. Verse 2, your arrows have pierced me. Psalm 38, 2, your hand has come down on me. Verse 3, your wrath, there's no health in my body. My bones have no soundness because of my sin. My guilt has overwhelmed me. Verse 5, my wounds fester and are loathsome. Verse 6, I am bowed down and brought very low. All day long I go about morning. He lost his sense of humor. He, he, he was sorrowful all the time. Uh, notice he goes on to say, by, uh, verse 7, my back is filled with searing pain. There's no health in my body. Verse 8, I'm feeble, utterly crushed. I groan in my anguish. Verse 9, all my longings lie open before you. My sighing is not hid from you. Verse 10, my heart pounds, my strength fails. Even the light has gone out of my eyes, the luster for life. Verse 11, my friends and companions avoid me. Because nobody wants to be around a guy that's always moaning and groaning, and uh, you know, uh, uh, like this. Uh, uh, verse 12, those who seek my life set a trap for me. Those who would harm me talk of my ruin. All day long they plot for, plot for my deception. Uh, he knows his enemies are getting an upper hand, you see. Verse 14, I've become like a man who doesn't hear, whose mouth can offer no reply. He even prays, I wait for you, O Lord, uh, and, and I don't get an answer. Verse 17, I am about to fall. My pain is ever with me. Now what happens? What does verse 18 say? I, what's the word? I confess my iniquity. That is rebound. That is confession of sin. All that he's going through, he's suffering. But he says, I will confess my sin to the Lord. And uh, that's what happens in first, uh, Second Samuel chapter 12. Nathan comes along and says, the prophet says, well, Sir, okay, there's a man, uh, there are two, rich men, uh, two men. One is very rich, one is rather poor. The rich man has a large number of cattle and sheep. The poor man has only one little ewe lamb. He bought it, he raised it, he grew up with him and his children. It shared his food, drank from his cup, even slept in his arm. It was like a daughter to him. Now a, a, a traveler comes along to the rich man's house. And the rich man doesn't go out and kill one of his flock. No. It, to get a meal for the traveler. Instead, he takes the ewe lamb that belongs to this poor man. He prays for present for him, and he gives it to his visitor. Look at uh, 2 Samuel 12, 5. David burned with anger toward the man, and he said, As the Lord lives, the man who did this deserves to die. Right. The sin unto death. This man, he must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, Sir, you are the man. I just, man, just, can you see him sitting up there on the throne with his righteous indignation? And then to find that, that bony finger of the old prophet, Sir, you're the man. <clears throat> I don't know if you've ever been caught with your hand in the cookie jar. Caught in a sin, you know. Wait, uh, uh, you thought you got away with something, and bam, you didn't. And you start turning red from top. You could just almost feel it going from the top of your head all through the, down to the tip of your toe. You're caught. Caught red-handed. 
There he is. Well, now see, he deserved death. No question about it. He deserved the sin of death because he had insulted the Lord. And, and that's what, they, what Nathan tells him, see. Uh, please note the grace in verse, uh, as was, as verse 7 continues. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. I anointed you king over Israel. Grace. I delivered you from the hand of Saul. Grace. I gave your master's house to you. Grace. And your master's wives into your arms. Grace. I gave you the house of Israel and to Judah. Grace. And if all of this was too little, I would have given you even more. I'd, David, I'd give you anything you want. Except Bathsheba. She's off limits. Anything you want, I'll give you anything in grace. Why did, notice what he said in verse 9, why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? And tragedy of tragedies. I want you to notice the, the verse 13 and 14. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. Nathan replied, the Lord has taken away your sin. You are not going to die. But, please notice, verse 14, but because by doing this you have made the enemies of the Lord show utter contempt, there's going to be a price to pay. And there's a fourfold. You said, you said David, didn't you, that that rich man's going to have to pay back four times? Now you got it. Number one, the baby dies. Number two, seven years go by in the installment plan. Seven years go by, and then his son, Amnon, rapes his half-sister, David's daughter, Tamar. Bathsheba revisited. Mm -hmm. Then Tamar's brother, Absalom, murders Amnon, Uriah. Revisited. Hmm? <laughs> yes. And then, uh, by the time 15 years have gone by, Absalom enters into the Absalom rebellion in which he rebels against his father, just as David rebelled against the Heavenly Father in his sin. See how God matches these things out? Somebody has said, it isn't Scripture, but somebody said, the mills of God grind very slowly but they grind very, very fine. You don't get away with anything with God. You may from government, you may from other people, but you never get away with anything from God. Why? Because He loves you too much. He won't let you go. If you've gone too far, He'll take you out of this life. If, he, if not, and why does He do this? And please notice, see, David had time to grow spiritually in between here so that he would be able to handle these things. And let me tell you, folks, some of David's sweetest psalms were written during this time of great adversity and difficulty. And so the grace of God provides breathing room so that the believer can grow spiritually to receive the blessing from the increments of installment discipline. Oh, isn't he a gracious God? I'll tell you, I'm glad we have that kind of a message. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is so amazing. It's beyond our understanding. But we make an effort at it. Now, thank you, Heavenly Father, for your grace. Even when we sin, you grace us out. When we're wrong, you grace us out. We have been graced out from day after day after day, never earning or deserving, and yet the recipient of all that you have for us. May God the Holy Spirit help us to appreciate your matchless grace as we continue our study together. In Jesus' name, amen. Super Grace on Sunday.